when I was coming here, I was thinking what, what to say and how to introduce uh, John and Robin, who is uh, new, one of our newest additions to the faculty here at the school. And I always find it's kind of a tricky um, for somebody who is at the very early stage of his career to talk about, because it's not so much, it, it, it's much easier to introduce somebody when you talk about the past and the work that has been done and accomplished. It's, this one is a kind of a tricky one because it's about talking about the gambling of the promise of the world and the world that it was supposed to come from. <coughs> now, in our long tradition of Sayak, um, as has been referring many times, Sayak is a lot like Deadwood, for those of you who follow HBO. It's a wild west in the sense of you walk into the bar, and you have to get your guns out and start shooting because if not, you will get shot. So that's why John and I have the first semester teaching in Sire. He finished his graduate studies not that long ago. So he kept jumping to teaching, but also, okay, you can do Sire, you have to lecture, you have to talk about your work and where your work is and where you think your work is going. It doesn't matter if you have 30 years of career behind you or you only have five or you have one. The, the premise is always the same, is to challenge and to define if, if the person that is talking to you constitute what we treasure in Sire as the kind of people that we want in the school. We treasure architecture as, an in, as a problem of intensity and obsession and commitment. So we like to test and see if the people that are teaching you and discussing every day with you guys are made on the same good that we think we want the school to be made. Um, I like to think that Jonah belongs to that kind of group of people and that kind of a obsessive compulsive commitment to architecture which in any other place will certify as, a, as an insane person but in our field is basically normal to good um, but what I mean intrigue is how he can talk about where the work is where the work will be going and how the relation with teaching and teaching in Sire will help to shape that and to completely change the notion of what we, I would call historically has been known as the critical project that we like to think that in Sire we're shifting and trying to change the critical project into a new kind of a condition that had to do with the problem of a conceptual and theoretical thing in relation to design but they will emanate from the design. So I think this is a challenge that we post from the school to him, and hopefully today will be the first one of many to come in which he starts to respond how to operate within that landscape of ideas that we're trying to push and to discuss with all of you. So, <clears throat> no further ado, Jonah Rowan. Thanks so much. Um, so first of all, thank you all for coming. Uh, like Hernan said, um, my students are here, I know, because I told them that I would fail them all if they didn't show up. Um, but for those of you who are here of your own volition, thanks for coming. Um, thanks to Hernan for the gracious introduction and, and uh, for inviting me to Sire in general and to develop some of these ideas uh, that I'll be talking about today. Um, the, it was really a nice introduction. Um, the truth is I was just a pain in his ass at Yale last year, so that's why I'm here. Um, uh, also, I'd like to thank Todd for, um, for agreeing to talk with me about some of these uh, sort of still nascent and uh, developing ideas. Um, one thing that made me nervous about Hernan's introduction is that if this is where uh, the work is going, I'm probably in trouble. Um, but uh, but um, I wanted to start off with this slide because uh, the SciArc website had my name up. Uh, until a couple of days ago, as Jonah Rowe, which was a uh, fortuitous coincidence, and it's R O W E instead of uh, my name, which is R O W E N. Um, so this is a house for for my uh, namesake, uh, Colin Rowe. Uh, but uh, also, uh, Colin Rowe, we 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 know this uh, this distinction that he makes in the seminal essay about. Uh, literal and phenomenal transparency. Um, I'm going to talk about labyrinths today, um, but what I'm going to talk about are uh, not so much literal labyrinths as we're given to understand them, but uh, instead, and if it were to make things easier, I could talk about uh, conceptual labyrinths. 
I would rather I could talk about phenomenal labyrinths. Instead, I'm going to talk about uh, conceptual labyrinths. So the territory that we're operating in is the distinction between literal and conceptual rather than literal and phenomenal. There are certain aspects that are similar, but I'll, I'll sort of parse through these differences. And to do that, I'm going to use a different career drawing. We're going to stay with career for a little while. But um, I'm going to use this drawing by the young career uh, that is owned by MoMA in New York. Um, it's called Labyrinth City by MoMA, but it's got this inscription down here that says, uh, Liz Beard will um, reprieve uh, due 10, 11, 71. I'll talk about some of this a little bit more. Um, but just to talk about the drawing for a little while, uh, what we understand is that there are two parts. There's a bird's eye view up here and a section down here. Um, there's a ring, it shows a ring road going around some uh, quarter of something. Um, it is in the shape of a square dug into the ground with uh, paths coming off of each corner of uh, this pit. On the left, there's a spiraling upward tower, and then on the right, there's a spiraling downward one. And in the foreground, we see this uh, enfolded system of paths. Uh, in the background, presumably, there's some uh, inverted uh, mirror to that, but uh, we are not quite sure what that is. So. Um, just to begin talking about this drawing, uh, uh, one other aspect actually is that in the pit there are a bunch of these buildings that um, are on pillow T, but their roofs are at ground level. Um, so uh, just to uh, begin talking about this drawing, everything is doubled, which uh, puts us sort of in within the affect of mass, and we see that actually in the running bond uh, or stack bond pattern here and here. Um, so besides the fact that there's a positive to everything and a negative to everything, there's this rotational symmetry which happens based on the fact that the running bound pattern happens here and here, but here these walls are blank. So we can understand this sort of uh, spinning. Um, additionally, based on what we see down here, Los Fierdel, uh, Fierdel is, is quarter. It's, uh, what we're seeing is, is some fragment of something else. We're not sure what that something else is, but what we know is that this is not a whole in itself. Um, we've talked about mass a little bit, but um, the, what, we are, what we understand from the section from all of the shaded cliche is, uh, is this idea of carving through, um, carving upwards and downwards in a certain sense. Um, uh, here is uh, the career drawing again on the left, and a uh, Piranesi drawing on the right, uh, the Pianta di Ampio uh, Magnifico Collegio. Uh, aside from the fact that there are certain formal similarities between these two drawings, on the left there's a circuit, uh, on the right there's a circuit. Uh, they both are composed of a, uh, a cruciform orthogonal to the, or more or less orthogonal to the viewing plane. Uh, and then another one rotated 45 degrees, so this octagonal pattern. Um, and they both have punctuated ends of those uh, cruciforms. Um, additionally, when you dig a bit deeper, you see that on the left there is, uh, here, there's a center, but there's nothing in the center. And on the right, in the Piranesi drawing, uh, if you uh, sort of dig into this a little bit, you'll see that uh, in fact, despite all the stairways and pathways, you can't actually get to the center. So on the left, we have an absent center, on the right, an uninhabitable one. Um, and uh, additionally, aside from the fact that there's nothing in the actual center here, there are several parts to this drawing, each with its own center. So there's sort of a deflection of, uh, of, of where the center is. And the same thing happens in this Piranesi drawing, where there are these eight wedges but the center of each wedge is not in the center that we would expect in the middle of the drawing. It's actually uh, here. So there are eight centers around the center. None of those is actually in the center. Um, so uh, just to return to this idea of uh, parsing between literal and conceptual, um, again, on the right, uh, we see uh, sharp, the, the paving pattern of the, the Cathedral Chart, uh, which is uh, closer to what I would call, what, what we understand is the icon of a literal labyrinth. Um, 
which is two-dimensional and, easy, and easily understandable. Um, on the left, of course, Creer's drawing is far more complex. It has levels and passageways underground uh, and above ground. Um, and uh, we'll return to this, this again, but um, on the right, just uh, to, to make this distinction uh, totally clear, on the right, what we see is an icon. On the left, uh, something far more uh, complex. Um, and uh, so in addition to these ideas of, uh, to, the, to what we were talking about, the, the Piranesi, um, besides the dislocation from center, there's also, uh, you can understand to some degree, a uh, dislocation of, of place that in no place in the career drawing can one be at the center, whereas in the sharp, uh, in sharp it's very clear where the center is. Um, and uh, then to add one further uh, element to this, um, on the left in Creer's drawing, we see the uh, spiraling upward tower. Um, just this is one example uh, of the type of references that Creer is making. This is another level of displacement, uh, clearly a chronological displacement. So what Creer is showing us is uh, some reference to something that spirals. You, you could read uh, the Guggenheim into this. Uh, I have Boulay's, one of Boulay's cenotaphs, which itself is a reference to Trajan's column in Rome. But um, uh, also, you can read into this uh, references to Taplin's uh, Monument of the Third International, or uh, Bramante's Staircase at the, Vat at the Vatican, or Vignola's at the uh, Villa Farnese Caparola, um, or various, uh, one can read Rossi into this. Um, the buildings in the center uh, have a certain relationship either to, to Le Corbusier's uh, uh, villa at Carthage or to uh, his Maison Citroën at uh, the Weissenhofs Um But regardless, there's, there's this sort of panoply of reference that displaces the time of the drawing. Uh, and uh, so just to go back over a couple of the things that we've now talked about as sort of properties of, of what I'm calling conceptual labyrinths. Um, the drawing is fragmentary. Mass becomes important. Uh, decentralization, dislocation in space, and then dislocation in time. Um, now, uh, again, with these sort of uh, numbered things, I'm, I'm going to go through what I'll what I'll sort of talk about as as six points uh, of of uh, the labyrinth for as a sort of essential. Uh, symbol, or, or uh, we can talk about this more, but, but a metonym for architecture. Uh, that is that it's a part of architecture, it also represents the whole of architecture. Um, so the first point that I'll talk about is uh, the labyrinth as an originary myth of architecture. Um, here I just have a couple of examples um, of originary myths. What's important is that the labyrinth stands as one of these. It's not necessarily the origin of architecture, it's one of many <coughs> origins of architecture. So on the left is Abbe Sujet, uh, the Basilica at Saint Denis, which uh, the, uh, Sujet was a, uh, uh, a uh, medieval admirer of Gothic architecture, and his his sort of myth for the beginning of architecture was was uh, light. Um, of course, Loger's uh, well-worn uh, primitive hut that we all know, uh, Gottfried Semper's. Uh, uh, knots or weaving as the origin of architecture and, and just a drawing of a labyrinth by Fischer von Erlach. Um, the advantage of the labyrinth as one of the myths of architecture is that it, uh, it has an architect, Daedalus. Uh, it has an entire mythology to go along with it. Um, that, that may be a different subject for a different day. Um, the, second, uh, the second point that I'll talk about is uh, this difference between and this is Amiens Cathedral and uh, the uh, Mundaneum. Um, the second point that I'll talk about is the discrepancy between written accounts of the labyrinth, uh, which are, in fact, much more vivid uh, than what we see here as, as the icon, which we saw oh, sure. as well. Um, that sort of discrepancy between uh, the, the, the ancient uh, accounts of labyrinths 
And what we see here, I, I sort of see as fertile ground for architecture, that, uh, that the spatial complexity described in Herodotus or Virgil is uh, much more uh, interesting than what could we understand here uh, as the icon. Um, what you read in the accounts of labyrinths is uh, descriptions of, of levels or passageways. Um, what I was describing before as, as things that don't necessarily have a center, whereas in the icon, there is a single center and a single path. Um, so the third point uh, has to do with the, um, the interiority of architecture, um, which is to say that, and this is a somewhat circular argument, that, that uh, architecture has an inside. It always has an inside. Um, and there is nothing but the inside. So one is always sort of turned back onto the inside. And, and I think metaphorically, this, this, uh, these two pieces sort of uh, make this argument that uh, what Piranesi does here in the Campo Marzio plan is he takes, we're looking at just this part, takes uh, the amphitheater, the Balbi amphitheater, draws his own piece, this is a distinctly Piranesian piece of plan, and then he puts in Baldessari Peruzzi, the piece that, that, um, that, is, that shows up in Serlio's treatise, but is not, uh, it, it's uh, very clearly not a part of ancient Rome. So by throwing us into this sort of chronological labyrinth, we uh, understand this idea of the interior. Um, uh, a uh, related point to this, and, and I'll just, uh, as a segue, I'll uh, just quote Aldo Rossi. It says, truly every architecture is also an architecture of the interior, or better, an architecture from the interior. On the left, we see Rossi's uh, school of Fagnano Olona. Of course, um, the, the idea of the analogous city, of which uh, Fagnano Olona is a uh, good example, is that one is never, uh, even when looking at, at uh, teapots on a table, one can understand oneself inside of, of the city of those teapots. Um, uh, so, um, this also, the interiority sort of returns us to the idea of mass and the fact that one can't be sure of what's going on on the inside or on the outside, that, that, these, uh, that there's uh, sort of a radical uh, difference between what's happening on the inside and the outside. Um, and what that will lead us to is um, the, the, let's see, am I up to, I'm up to the fifth point, which is that, um, that uh, in a certain way, uh, architecture then becomes, the, the fact that one is always inside uh, sort of reinforces the point that, uh, that architecture must, or, or the, the architecture of the labyrinth must be anti-iconic and therefore anti-spectacular. Um, a sort of companion to that is that while there's no outside, there is this gap between uh, the, the what is outside and what, what is uh, sort of assumed to be inside. Um, in a certain way, again, there, this, I'm speaking in, in some sense metaphorically, but what we see here from Mises Neue National Gallery is uh, the plinth, which acts as this gap between the city and the architecture. Um, so one is detached from what is outside in order to enter. Um, and the sixth point that I'll talk about is um, the priority of plan and section. That subjective perception is necessarily uh, uninformative in terms of the labyrinth. It uh, does not show us anything. And uh, plan and section become absolutely operative, but no single drawing can uh, encapsulate the object. And, and this is what we saw in Creer as well, um, that his bird's eye view and the section view didn't show the whole story, that there's still something missing. Um, and just to return to this idea about the, the written labyrinths being more vivid, in fact, than the icons of labyrinths, um, that uh, the plan and section become the important forms of uh, what we could call sort of architectural writing or inscription. Um, 
And uh, finally, the seventh point is that the labyrinth is important because David Bowie used it to ensnare Jennifer Conn. Uh, <laughs> you know that. Uh, all right, so now just to briefly rehearse some of these ideas in, in some of the work that I've done. Um, <coughs> this is a recently completed project, uh, hot off the presses, um, for a hotel. Um, uh, this is a project done with uh, Natal Casalongo. Um, the approach was related to the Campo Marzio plan, which we saw before. Uh, that's to say that um, it, what we were aiming to do was, was to work with an architecture of parts that had no, necessarily, no necessary relationship <coughs> to one another. Um, so here's a site plan. Uh, one thing that became interesting was that the brief asked for uh, the, an existing building to be retained. So that's this. Um, so what, what that became for us was what the Ecole de Beaux-Arts would call uh, an hors de shell, which, is, which Colin Rowe, again, uh, describes as a calculated intrusion of an out-of-scale element. Uh, each element that we introduced became sort of a, a, some kind of reflection, but also uh, radically different from the uh, original building. Um, another, so the operations that we were using had to do with uh, folding and slicing. Um, uh, the, uh, and also, uh, the strategy that we were talking about was uh, had to do with sort of the three little pigs, uh, but instead of uh, straw and uh, sticks and brick, we were using sort of irreconcilable forms. That was the idea. But um, but uh, there also was this this uh, idea having to do with a um, difference between front and back, and a difference between inside and outside. So one gets the sense that there are these levels of interiority of the project, and one is never wholly inside anything, or one is never wholly outside of anything. Um, so just to move on, uh, this is another project. This is a project for an archive. Um, the idea here was that, uh, similarly, uh, one always understands oneself to be outside of something. Uh, in this case, it's uh, the, the vaults, which are really the largest part of the program and the reason for the project's being. But also, uh, what became interesting for me doing this project was that um, it's also, this, this diagram shows that uh, this largest piece of the program is also the sort of most the, the most sparsely inhabited uh, part of the program. <coughs> so what became interesting was that this thing sort of, um, one always moves around this thing, but never actually enters it. And um, so that's what's drawn in this section. Um, and uh, when moving around this thing, one always understands that he or she is sort of uh, moving around in relation to the mass of this thing. Um, in fact, at one point, one is actually allowed to enter. Um, but still, there's this sort of impermeability of it. Um, and uh, so what I was describing before about moving around it is that, um, that circulation always becomes circumambulation, that one is moving around. Um, and then this, this uh, was taken to the outside as well, that, that uh, the interior becomes obscured and uh, there's this deferral of understanding of what's happening on the inside. Uh, the final project I'll talk about is a project for the regional center of, in Venice. Um, it is uh, on the site of Le Corbusier's uh, Venice Hospital, which you see here. Um, so there's already this idea of, um, of uh, chronological displacement happening here. Um, Le Corbusier's project is, in fact, a what I would call a more literally labyrinthine. Um, uh, it, uh, if you look at the planet, it becomes clear. Um, but the project for, for us, this was done with Daniel Markevich, uh, the project for us was predicated on an intentional act of misreading. Uh, it's just some study models. 
Um, if you look at the, the, um, the, the plan of the Venice Hospital, you understand that it is composed of two nine squares overlapped, or a 16 square with two squares removed. Um, what we were interested in doing was looking at that as an axonometric drawing and recollapsing those back on each other. Um, the uh, constructed genealogy that we were trying to work with uh, was these two contemporaneous projects on the top is, uh, again, Le Corbusier's Venice Hospital. Uh, in the middle is, uh, I showed before, uh, Mises Noya National Gallery. Um, both projects done around the same time in the 60s. Um, on the top, Le Corbusier takes Piloti and raises the hospital off the ground uh, in a city that you could argue has no ground. Um, in some cases, he raises it uh, four or five stories off the ground. Uh, Mies, uh, on the other hand, situates it firmly inside of the ground. So again, we're seeing this parting, lifting uh, reciprocity. Um, the, uh, the goal of our project was to sort of triangulate between these two these two ideas of what the ground could do. So in order to do that, what we what we did was uh, we thought of our project as a plinth, but instead of putting uh, buildings on top of the plinth, we impressed buildings into the plinth. Um, so that's what's happening in these four pieces. Um, and uh, just a plan detail. Um, what we were interested in, in doing with this was to um, to say that the ground now became the top of the building, and that to enter, uh, one would always enter by, by descending into the building. Um, so you can see that here in the section. And, and what, what became interesting about this for us was that uh, the, the sort of jagged urban forms of Venice that one is pressed to deal with in, in, uh, in some sort of contextual sense only became sort of manifest on the uh, inside of the building. So this artificially chthonic interior becomes uh, sort of uh, the, the, the relationship to what is outside. Um, and the, the final thing I'll talk about with this project is the, the importance of the pochet, um, which is to say that one understands uh, the pochet here is taken up by bank vaults, which happened to know here, gallery storage, uh, various mechanical program, etc. Um, what became uh, important was that one always understands oneself in sort of radical alterity to the mass of the architecture. Um, I'm going to end here. This is a uh, project, uh, fragmentary study for a project without an outside. So thank you very much. Awesome. 
possible uh, intrusion. Yeah, um, I think that you know it's it's a it's a tough question because I, yeah, well, uh, I think that um, you could make the argument that there are sort of loose strands of of what we could loosely call postmodernism uh, that that don't uh, that haven't that never really were picked up again. Um, I, I wouldn't really argue that that's what I'm trying to do. But I would also say that uh, any sort of self-conscious uh, attempt at um, contemporaneity seems to me to be in some ways uh, futile. So um, what I'm what I guess I, I would argue I'm interested in doing is not so much to pick up on things that other people left behind, uh, but try to mine the um, potentials of, of uh, certain sort of ways of thinking that I see as pervasive rather than stylistic. So, well, I guess, I mean, this is probably another way to ask the same question, but uh, The way that you set up the lecture is the, was to put your work into conversation with work that was at least 40 years old and sometimes 400. You know, there are certain genres that, that you, you, know, you kind of, Piranesi, Boulay, that, you know, that kind of, uh, uh, that world as well as the, you know, kind of career Odyssey that was certainly working in. And, and I wonder about that choice rather than putting your work in maybe what is more common technique putting your work in conversation with, with an immediate contemporary. Yeah. Uh, you know, it would have been, given that Mark Gage, another uh, Yale classicist, was speaking here on Wednesday, yeah. uh, you know, it, it could be a very interesting conversation to look at two sure. approaches. One is like chasing Lady Gaga uh, as <coughs> aggressively as possible, and the other seems just couldn't be less interested in, in some of those uh, more sort of overtly pop culture references. Why, why the choice to put your work in a conversation with um, the ancients, let's call it? Well, okay, so I think there are two answers to that. One would be um, sort of uh, disciplinary, let's say, and the other would be uh, more political. I'm not sure I'm ready to make the entire, you know, the entirety of the political argument, but um, Let's just start with a disciplinary one. I've been reading these, uh, it should come as no surprise maybe, that uh, I, I've been reading these lectures of Borges. Uh, what's great is that he will go, when he's giving lectures, he'll go and uh, he'll say, he'll sort of set up what he's talking about in terms of an argument with Nietzsche, for instance, on about Virgil or you know, something like that. You know, he'll, so he will, what, you know, I think there, the important facet of this work, you know, it, Another example maybe is if you read Jeff Kipnis about deconstruction in his sort of uh, simplifying for architects, what he'll tell you is that deconstruction is not new. It's this persistent thing over the history of over, you know, one can say that uh, Socrates did deconstruction. Um, I think that that's an important part of the way that I see the work that I do, that it's not, uh, I'm as much in conversation with people uh, in you know 500 years ago, or you know I'd like to be. I'm not saying I am, but um, I think it's it's part of uh, the importance of my work uh, of of not my work of, of understanding the, the work of the Renaissance that one can understand the arguments that they were making and how to how to respond to that today. I don't think those are dead in the same sort of sense that we're asking them. No, I, I wouldn't say that they're dead either, but I, I'm interested in the, how, what's to be gained by uh, reigniting some of those conversations. I mean, in a way, it's easier to have a conversation with uh, Virgil than it is to have a conversation with certain contemporary practitioners. Just Virgil, in many ways, is more available, right? And so part of the question is... I'd say it's harder how do you, it's a one-sided conversation. I'd say it's every <laughs> bit as one-sided if you try to talk to certain contemporary <laughs> practitioners. <laughs> and, and access is probably harder to achieve. 
right? So, so the question really becomes, I mean, if so much of uh, the, the kind of, of contemporary conversation is about you know, these sort of uh, uh, often cliquish conversations between a select few and, and sort of fairly well insulated uh, groups conversing primarily amongst themselves, uh, is the ambition to enter into one of those conversations or simply to start a new one? Like, I'm not interested in you guys and your renderings. I'm going to talk to Scamozzi about floor plans, and, uh, which I'm happy to do. Well, I think uh, ideally it would be both. It would be to, to say that we've got all these new uh, tools and, and playthings, right? And abilities to make things look as uh, wacky as we can, but um, but I think, I mean, I see this as much in conversation with uh, a lot of the people here as it is with Scamonte, for instance. How so? Um, well, for one thing, I'm using all the same tools. But another is that, uh, well, actually, there's one tool that I would say is that that's important, which is the the tool of the discipline. In other words, that uh, what I think is fertile ground for for architecture to mine is how do we take the things that we've now learned over the past ten or twenty years in the paradigm of the digital and reinflect it uh, with the the disciplinary history of what architecture has been for the last five hundred and fifty years. So in that sense, for you, the, the, your audience is primarily disciplinary. You're talking, sure. you're talking Absolutely. to experts with an expert language. Absolutely. And I think there, th that I see is probably the strongest contrast between uh, Mark's argumentation on Wednesday, where he was emphatically uh, laying out the importance of architecture reaching as broad an audience as possible, right? And he's going to pursue uh, as many lines of inquiry that he can in order to broaden that audience, right? So right. building the, you know, the heart of Times Square or any, any of those projects, are, you know, there, there's, a, there's a very clear ambition to bring the kind of, uh, to bring architecture into a broader world. And, and the technique that he used I, I, was to uh, suppress the disciplinary conversation, right? Right. I mean, so, so the whole, the, the first rule of parametrics is to not talk about parametrics. Uh, that, the, 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 I find it very interesting that the, the kind of two people coming out of this, coming from the same place to the same place, and having such divergently different ideas about how to address contemporary problems. One of them moving uh, very aggressively towards a broad popular audience and a kind of spectacular uh, presentation of architectural effects, right? The weird room, and that's it. Versus your work, which I think is uh, is is. You know, it's very clearly embedded in this kind of close disciplinary history. It requires you to learn to, to know a lot of, of architectural history and not just know it, but actually have opinions about it. And, and, and it's 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 funny. I wonder if what is beginning to emerge here is a new version of the old debate between avant-garde and kitsch. Uh, and is that such a good idea? Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I know that um, I know that what the the stance. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right to talk about the the, the um, difference between say spectacle and whatever the opposite is, um, which I'd like to align myself with. But at the at the same time, um, I think that uh, the, the well, the function of the discipline. Is I think the only reason that we can sort of uh, convene in a room like this and talk about work, right? There's not, as far as I'm concerned, there's not much to talk about if you don't talk about what other people have done. Right. Um, but uh, you know, then the flip side of that for me is that um, in order th that the that the work also needs to be able to stand on its own, and I think that that. It would be a mistake to to uh, to sort of, or I would take offense to the accusation that you need to know about all the things that go. In. Like I think, you know, the the hotel project that I recently finished um, has certain things in it that I think are important for me about, uh, say, the Villa Madama of Raphael. But 
I don't expect anyone looking at that to, or you know, I expect maybe one person looking at it to be able to say that and appreciate it. Everyone else can just look at it and say, it's a nice drawing. I think that's interesting. So, so in one sense, the, 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 the intellectual investment is personal mm -hmm. rather than uh, directed towards fostering a more, uh, a more engaged, More engagement with, with kind of history and the kind of broader discourse of consciousness. I mean, one of the one of the criticisms I think of recent architectural conversations is that they have been less than precise because they have been less than engaged in exactly the kind of disciplinary problems that I think you're trying to do for. Right? That if you want to have a serious architectural conversation, you have to talk like an expert. And in order to talk like an expert, you have to have some expertise. Right? And what and I, I think that you've gone quite a long way to demonstrate exactly that. So I find it funny that you would then turn around and say, but that's not part of the mode of address of the work. That the work, in fact, it, you know, not that it couldn't stand alone and appeal to a broad audience and, and that, that, that you know you could build it and people don't have to like, do their homework to understand the building, right. but that the disciplinary contribution of the work is somehow. Well, my position not, is, not that it, is that it has to do both. It absolutely has to do both. Um, that the reason for architecture as a discipline is that it uh, it must, I mean the reason that again that we can sit in a room like this and talk about uh, you know Scamozzi or, or Raphael is that uh, we have this history that we all need to learn about and be aware of. At the same time uh, I think that maybe what you're describing as Mark's position is also uh, an important thing that we need to do uh, in order to keep ourselves going, because architecture is, to some degree, a servile, a servile profession. I mean, we have to be able to appeal to other people. Every 
every minute I spend talking to you. Yeah. Are you like actually with me? <laughs> There's a painting of you in a closet somewhere that looks like hell. Uh, so, but how, what's different? In, I mean, to be super blunt about it. Uh, I mean, if we're gonna re, uh, if we're gonna reignite the nine square problem through the Venice Hospital, what did you do differently? How could you like really specifically lay out those? Yeah, I what are you adding to the conversation? Um, I think that's a great question, and I'm not sure I have a great answer for it, uh, except that, except to say that uh, the I think that 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 kind of intense um, sort of interrogation of the discipline is largely missing from the contemporary discussion. So uh, my only answer, and I probably need to go back and think more about this, but my only answer at this point would be that, uh, that the, uh, the contemporary scene needs more of the nine square problem, to put it uh, sort of simply and stupid. Um, I'll take that. I mean, I, I, I would have gone more to the, 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 it does seem that there is a, at least a kind of intuitive sense that the role of materials and perspe perception, despite your sixth point of plan and section being the operative technique, that, uh, that the, the effects that are closely associated with materiality and perception, right? The, one of the things about a labyrinth is it's a path, right? And it sets up a certain choreography uh, so in that sense, you can say it's a return to the architect, probably not architect, but, 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 but that there does seem to be a very, you know, you're very careful to keep one hand on uh, kind of haptic experience. You know, yeah. and so the material effects come in, I mean, at, at this point, they're, they're sort of uh, pursued primarily in the renderings, but even in the, the object floating within the sort of veil-like facade of the archive is, a, I think, a similar move to, to make sure that the uh, material and tactile effects, which were maybe, uh, which the, the kind of nine square generation had often been accused of leaving behind, it seems to be very careful to keep those in the mix as well. Um, that, that would be, you'd be uh, giving me sort of a gift by saying that. But you, no, I, I appreciate it. you're welcome. I appreciate it. <laughs> but, um, but I think the important part of that for me is it, in that sense, that's the part that I'll, where I'll agree with Mark. It's sort of like there are the haptic effects, the effects, but we don't talk about the haptic effects. <laughs> They're there, right? And we want them to be there, but we, but that's not a part of the, the what we, or, you know, that's not a part of the generation. And it's interesting that everybody's got a kind of gag order on some, some component of the conversation. I mean, that's, I think, a, a bigger question. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I do want to turn it over a little bit to, to everybody else in the room, but I, I really enjoy, I mean, the, the idea of the, the, the labyrinth also, I mean, it, it, it kind of, uh, I like the kind of foundation myth version of it. I've dabbled in it in, in some writing for myself. But for me, it was always that the labyrinth was this moment where architecture is fundamental investment in excess was made clear, right? So that, that if, if you think about the labyrinth as a, as a job for Daedalus, the job was make a prison. And Daedalus chose to make a really complicated prison that didn't have a door, right? I mean, and so, so, so somehow embedded in this particular first work of architecture is a completely absurd and excessive and overdone and undoubtedly way over budget and off schedule <laughs> solution to a fairly simple problem, which is like, put that monster in a box. And, and I, 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 I say that only because the way that I look at your work and the kind of intensity of labor, the sort of excess of uh, attention to drawings. I mean, to kind of return to those fantastic old drawings where you lay the plan over the section and project the plan into exonometric and really sort of spin this web of kind of graphic complexity into the work. I, I for one, am like happy to see that stuff come back. I'm not totally sure that you have yet like reached a kind of escape velocity from yeah. some of the earlier works that you're mining, but I, I do think that you're probably a hell of a lot closer to reaching that velocity than a lot of the a lot of people that I've seen. But um, so for me, that I, I find like super uh, super exciting. 
And uh, with that, I will turn it over to anyone else. Uh, if you have it, otherwise, I'm happy to just keep talking to this guy. <laughs> I can call on people as well. You're sitting in the same chair. So. I've already forced them to come. I can't force them to this question. <laughs> Yeah, but okay. That's true. So, just earlier today, fortuitously, I read Jeff, a, a little blurb by Jeff on uh, Eisenman's chart. I think the spoken into the void or thing of who does. And it was, it's a beautiful, very pithy uh, comment about Eisenman being a heretic who never quite loses the faith. The faith. And then that, 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 that somehow, when, when I Again, beautiful, beautiful work. I think thoughtful, reflective. I think the idea of the drawing as a form of writing, the short essay, the the, the, the there's something kind of uh, enviably tidy about that uh, um, kind of thinking and presentation. But um, uh, so <coughs> words like criticality, autonomy, um, you know, people like Adorno and Agamben and. So, you know, people who are identifiable with a kind of a project of, let's say, a negative project, uh, a, a sort of diametrically opposite to, I, I wasn't at Mark's talk, but I can imagine. Um, so, and, and again, it sort of weaving back into, into, in, into Todd's um, kind of line of inquiry, um, is there a cultivated madness in here, the notion of the double? Like, and, 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 out is there a schizophrenia that that you evoke to? Yeah, well, I think that's that's sort of that's an interesting way of uh, thinking about it. I think that uh, that schizophrenia sort of uh, is exactly what I'm trying to make <coughs> reference to in, in, or maybe maybe the analogy that I see between uh, the written accounts of the labyrinth and the iconic uh, drawing of the labyrinth that. And you know maybe the same sort of uh, opposition happens in the difference between plan and section. And, you know, when you look at, I was just telling my students yesterday, you look at uh, the four books of architecture, and Palladio has a plan and a section right next to each other on the same page that don't even come close to matching up. But that sort of discrepancy is exactly where I see the sort of uh, fertile ground or sort of potentiality of architecture. So again, this sort of difference between in the, the, in the career drawing, the uh, positive part and the negative part, that, that sort of uh, interstice becomes the sort of, I mean, that, it's all, it all becomes so sort it's of another, more. It's yeah. another form of dislocation. There's right. a breach in information, and you enter forensically if you can understand that right. pretty yeah. simply. What I'm really interested in is the Yale-centric uh, thing here between Mark and you. And I have a suspicion about one side of it and the other. But you know, I was talking to these two about um, Harold Bloom and the anxiety of influence. And you mentioned misreading and constructive genealogy. Both are his, his words about the Athene and the predecessor. And it seems like a almost a, a Talmudic way of working through history, very different than Marx, right? Where you're you're in love with the stuff um, and in awe of it, but you're mandated to work on it and not do better than it, but to work on it and within it. So I'm wondering if you're tracking his his anxiety of influence here with the work, which is he would say that the anxiety is the the poetry itself. Yeah, like the anxiety being, it's a very close modern thing, let's say, to be within that anxiety and produce something which is admirable, yeah? And so the anxiety is part of the, the, the beauty of it. And I really feel that anxiety of the work, that close reading, uh, is, it verges on the mystical, uh, in a way. So I, I don't, I'm not sure about the schizophrenic part of this, but the mystical part of it, of, of rereading and undoing and, and rethinking something like the labyrinth becomes productive if you're good, right? If you're hopeful, if you're if you're mystical enough to pull something out of it that gets the velocity that Tom yeah. uh, Tom is talking about, which maybe this is sort of getting out of here, right? And I think it could be it's a moment 
Uh, it's absolutely a moment, and that, that it changes everything that happened before that. So uh, how do you get to that moment? Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Check back in another 10 years. Am I correct in thinking about Harold Bloom or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I took a class with Harold Bloom. Um, I, I, um, I admire the book. Uh, it's a weird thing to say that I admire the book, uh, maybe, because uh, it, you know, to talk about the, the influence of Harold Bloom, even, it's like, where, where do we go from there? Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, put that in a certain way, you could say then that, um, Mark, maybe, maybe uh, in 10 years I'll be where Mark is now, um, in the sense that uh, he's sort of freed himself from the anxiety of influence, perhaps. And I uh, haven't yet. He'll be know. where you are. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's a weird orbit. <laughs> How about a student? Oh, when we talked about uh, Mark's lecture a little bit, we talked about how he, he claimed like it was all about um, aesthetics, but then maybe it's more about like the culture <coughs> of New York and stuff. And then um, you talked about in your six points about the like different dichotomies that you were interested in dealing with labyrinths. But then in your seventh point, you actually did talk about culture a little bit and. I was wondering if you thought about like a dichotomy and culture that can be applied to the labyrinth that could protect it further. Um, that's a, that's a maybe I took that slide too seriously. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good spread. Um, I would say I mean this this sort of gets back to what we were talking about in terms of. Uh, the spectacle, and, and my my sort of uh, ambition is to uh, figure out a way to do architecture that is not um, boring, but also not spectacular. And um, I, I I wouldn't say you know I've been thinking about pop culture recently, um, not pop culture, not anything in pop culture, but pop culture itself. Mm -hmm. That. Um, Again, I mean, you're probably all going to say, of course, you're confused, but uh, if you go back and you say, uh, Piranesi, uh, what Piranesi did was he took uh, something like um, the mausoleum of Hadrian and said, this is architecture, where no one would call it architecture before. It didn't have borders or anything like that. Um, you could sort of say that Le Corbusier did the same thing when he took uh, grain elevators and he said, let's look to grain elevators as architecture. No one would have called that architecture. Um, you know, Kohlhaas did this by looking at the Berlin Wall. Um, in some sense, you could make the argument that Greg Lynn uh, did this by, by, by uh, bringing in certain pop culture references and saying, let's make this architecture. Um, I would say that uh, I don't have anything analogous to that. Um, I think if the only argument that I can make about uh, culture has to do with the culture of architecture. So the, the argument that we need to go and look at architecture and what architecture has given us and make architecture out of architecture. I, I think that's a really important point. And I think that for me that, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of what is that, that, what's that kind of thing that you bring to this. And I, I'm not, it's not like it's a brand new thing, but the one thing that you, I think, are aggressively, and the more I hear you talk, the more aggressively I see your commitment to it, uh, is, a commitment to the disciplines as such. And it's it's interesting because in all of the examples that you mentioned, uh, whether it's Pyrenees in the tomb or full hospital in the wall or the brain elevators or Mark of Lady Gaga, uh, all of these uh, all of these examples in some fundamental way are looking outside the field for the answer. Right, the architect, in, in, in that line of questioning, this is a way that Sylvia Levin has often set up kind of this sort of conversation. But in that line of questioning, architecture is always seen as deficient and in need of outside help for its continued uh, existence. And what I really enjoy about about the project and what I really enjoy the kind of lineage that you've kind of attached yourself to is that it, in a way, it refuses to take that weak position. It refuses to put architecture in the underdog role. It refuses to say it's too
too bad we're not as cool as all of these other disciplines that pop culture has deemed cooler. And in that, I think that's how architecture can kind of really start to make some inroads into exactly those things, by celebrating exactly that kind of command of the labyrinth. You know, David Bowie got the girl. I think that's how you sort of, that's how I read that slide. Yes, but you uh, try. Uh, <laughs> so you need to rewrite the ending yeah. in a way. And, and so, I mean, just to kind of close up, I know everybody got, has to go to the studio, but you know, Hernan started this conversation by talking about Sciarth as being a version of dead book, right? And there's a whole, it, institutionally, it's a kind of gunfight and all of these things. And what I think is really exciting, and this is maybe the lunacy in your project, is that you are very seriously trying to bring a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen the knife. I've never been willing to bet on a knife wheeler until right now. So thanks very much for showing us your work.